push the big red record button. <laughs> hey, Pete. Okay, uh, welcome to the ordinary meeting of the 16th of January, everyone. Uh, we begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that we're gathered on tonight. That's the Gubby Gubby or Kabi Kabi people and pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. Um, we uh, then proceed to attendance and apologies. Councillor Stockwell uh, is visiting us all the way through the ether from Tasmania. Uh, in order to facilitate this, we do need a resolution to allow him to attend via teleconference. So there's a motion on the screen there. I'll move that. Uh, okay, well, it's already moved. Oh, oh, you moved it. Sorry, I didn't realise. Seconded Councillor Jackson. Oh. Uh, seconded Councillor Glasgow. I'll just read the motion. In accordance with Section 276 of the Local Government Regulation 2012, Council provide approval for Councillor Stockwell to attend Council's ordinary meeting the 16th of January 2020 by teleconference. Uh, I assume no one needs to speak to this. I'll put the motion. All those in favour. Thank you. That's carried. Welcome to the meeting, Brian. Good evening. You're now officially attending. Um, I need a confirmation of the minutes of the uh, ordinary meeting from the 19th of December. Moved yes. Councillor Wilkie, seconded Councillor Glasgow. Put the motion all those in favour. Thank you. Would you like to say aye. aye when I say that, Brian? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Uh, there are no mayoral minutes. There are no petitions, I don't think, are there? Anyone got a petition? Uh, there are no notified motions, no presentations, no deputations. So we move on to consideration of committee recommendations. Uh, being January in this round, there were no portfolio committees. Uh, there was simply a general committee meeting, uh, which of course was held on Monday. So we go to the recommendations from the general committee meeting. Item number one is amendments to the environmental levy pol policy and private land conservation policy guideline. Oh, uh, move, um... Yeah, there's a, been a change. Yeah. I was going to say, I believe there's some amended words. Oh, yeah, I'm moving the amended version. Okay. Uh, so just uh, for the sake of clarity, what was discussed at uh, Monday's General Committee meeting uh, was that uh, as part of the proposed uh, new policy, uh, the draft agreement uh, with VCA landholders was, was taken out and it's now been reinstated. Uh, so the policy now includes uh, a new paragraph that includes reinstating the details of the binding covenant example in Appendix 2 and the VCA example in Appendix 3 and authorise the CEO to make the necessary changes to the guideline to reflect those details being retained in Appendix 2 and 3. Uh, the rest of it is as uh, in the agenda. I second that. Uh, seconded, Councillor Glasgow. Do you wish to speak, Councillor Jackson? Um, well, I'm not going to just briefly say that I um, appreciate the work council staff have done to introduce an additional way of um, providing opportunities for people with voluntary conservation agreements and um, I think that the amendment which is simply to reinstate examples of um, agreements is a, a good one so that these are approved by council. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wish to speak? I'll put the motion in. All those in favour? Thank you. That's carried Aye. unanimously. Uh, we go on to the uh, further general committee meeting recommendations. Item number two is another change application for an MCU entertainment and dining business at 6 Thomas Street, Nooseville. Item number three is a material change of use for mixed-use commercial development at 218 and 20 Hoffman Drive, Nooseville. There's been some new wording uh, recommended beyond that, which was uh, recommended from the General Committee. Uh, the new wording comes from Council's planning solicitor. Uh, that has been distributed previously. Uh, is everyone uh, aware of this changed wording, yes. or do you want time to digest it? Just have a moment, just I'm aware, aware of it, I think. Yes, I've had time to read it. Thanks. I've had time to read it too. Is that all of it, Kat? Does it go further? No, that's a bit more. Can you scroll, please? Oh, I thought there was something there. Yeah. 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 yeah, okay, that's as we read it. Yep, okay. Uh, there's, there's, there's more. more. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it goes on and on. Yeah, yeah. It's mostly referencing, isn't that's it? That's right, yeah. it's mostly yeah. referencing. And then the addition of the three. And then oh. there's, there's a bit more strength given at the end. Um, for the sake of uh, clarity, um, most of it is, is uh, yeah. just 
uh, sort of uh, procedural tweaking, but the last three paragraphs, I think, should be read out. Uh, they read, the proposed uses are clearly defined by the Noosa plan and the applicant's proposed use definitions are unnecessary, inappropriate and have the potential to cause confusion. Uh, clause 15 is, there are no discretionary matters which would warrant approval of the development proposal. And 16, for the aforesaid reasons, approval of the development proposal would not advance the purpose of the Planning Act 2016. Uh, I'm looking for a mover and a seconder. Move, move Councillor Glasgow, I'll seconded second Councillor Gliss <laughs> Wilkins. Um, <laughs> do you wish to speak to it, Councillor Glasgow? No, it's all just said. Anyone wish no. to speak to this? I'll put the motion. All those in favour? Aye. Thank you. It's carried unanimously. We go back to the recommendations of the General Committee meeting. Item number four is a request to change a development approval for an MCU for premises at 25 Cowrie Street, Corroy. Well, so we deal with that uh, separately, separately as there, so were, there were issues associated with that, uh, uh, Mr Chair, and, uh, and information received from, um, from staff in regard to it. Certainly. So we'll deal with that item on its own. Uh, now, there were some questions raised at General Committee and there was a staff response circulated. Has everyone received that staff yes. response? Yes, that's right. Okay, yep. I'm looking for a mover and seconder, unless there are any questions relating to this item. I'll move that. Oh, you're a busy boy tonight. <laughs> Councillor Glasgow moved. Seconded by Councillor Wilkins. Second. Yeah. Uh, do you wish to speak to it, Councillor Glasgow? No, it's all been said, Chair. Yeah. Uh, anyone wish to speak to this? Just to ask, uh, just just to ask that a question to clarify sure. the, uh, the uh, issues that were raised by uh, uh, councillors at the time. Uh, with regard to the road widths and the requirements for footpaths uh, around the site, um, I don't have any particular issue with the uh, closing of uh, one of the accesses, but uh, I do see that uh, the loss of, um, or the, the decrease in the width of Cowrie Street was one of the... Uh, uh, the questions that was raised. If, uh... Point of order, yes. Mr. Chair. Councillor Jurisovich's question is not relevant to the motion before us. Uh, no, it's well, in a way I agree and in a way I don't, Councillor, uh, in that uh, the issue is about the egress uh, to the property from either street. Therefore, the issue came up at General Committee whether or not Olivine Street was wide enough to be able to take all the vehicle traffic. So I think I can allow. I was heading in that direction with my, my, my question for staff, and my question for staff was the one that was raised uh, with regard to um, uh, the, the, the matters that were raised at Monday's meeting. The widths of roads at both Cowrie Street and Olivine Street, uh, the, um, how were they uh, derived at with regard to uh, uh, safety and uh, parking and uh, the requirement for, for footpaths on both of those uh, access roads? Thanks, Kerry. Uh, the widths were are currently conditioned um, in the original approval uh, to be consistent with Council's planning scheme policies for road design. So there's a, the policy sets road widths based on the amount of traffic those roads are likely to carry in the future. Um, so they're consistent with that. Um, for Carry Street uh, in particular, it's quite a wide street at the entrance to Carry Street, approximately 11 metres wide, but then towards uh, the end of Carrie Street, it narrows down to eight metres, it tapers down. So um, the current conditions require a width of eight metres, consistent with the majority of Carrie Street and consistent with the planning scheme policy for this standard of a road. Can we say something? No, I'm sorry, you can't. Um, are you satisfied with that answer? Yeah, so it was just Thanks to clarify the, 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 the staff response with regard to uh, the questions raised. Sorry, just to clarify the staff response with regard to the questions raised by councillors on, uh, on Monday. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so the response is clear that uh, the widths of the road are in keeping with that in terms of the design uh, for Karoi and the types of roads that they are. So they're no bigger, no smaller, yes? That's right. Yep. Councillor Wilkie? Yeah, just... Uh, just to explain, sorry, before yeah, you do. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry, under our standing orders, uh, we can't allow for uh, members of the public or uh, the people in the gallery to interrupt the, uh, the uh, meeting just, session. Sorry about that. Can you explain to us how we can... Yeah, we are really concerned now. Uh, we've already sent you guys numerous emails, we've had no reply, 
we have many concerns. Okay, we need to take this up after the meeting, if you don't mind. Okay. Sorry, we, we can't include, we can't no incorporate worries. this part no. of the meeting, but um, I'll make sure that staff and myself come and talk to you at the end of the meeting. That would be fantastic. No worries. Councillor Wilkie. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. you're saying that um, the, the planning scheme requires a road width of eight metres? Yeah. Uh, the note we've got in front of us said site frontage 6.5 metres. Does that mean the road will be widened as part of this, the works that are going to be undertaken? Um, to you, Mr Chair. Uh, Olivine Street is, from memory, 6.5, and I'd have to check that, but it, it is narrow because it serves less traffic on that street. Um, and the width of Olivine Street would allow uh, two cars to pass, but it wouldn't allow parking. You'd have to, as you it would allow, if cars were parked in the street, you'd have to wait for the cars to pass. But that is the standard for that style of access street. Um, Cairo Street is eight metres wide, and that allows two cars to pass and one car to be parked on the, on the side of the road at the same time. So, um, the note we've got in front of us here, it says, um, refers to Cowrie Street, but it says, site frontage, 6.5 metres, conditioned to be eight metres wide. Yes. Does that mean that section of that width of road will be widened as part of the works? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, so currently that section of Carrier Street is only, the road pavement's only 6.5 metres wide. It is required to be widened to 8 metres for that section in front of the, the site. And that's consistent with the remainder of Carrier Street as you continue up the hill there. Okay, and then it says um, north of the site, it is 6 metres wide at the adjoining property extending to eight metres. So that, can you explain, will that six metres north of the site, will that be widened as well? The land north of the site hasn't been developed as yet, and there's no approval on that site for development. Okay. So there's no curb and channel. So it's envisaged that as that site develops, it will also be widened to eight metres. Okay. So it'll be consistent with that street. So the beginning of Carrie Street will be 11 metres. It will then narrow to eight metres, which will continue all the way up Carrie Street eventually. Thank you. Councillor Pesto. Oh uh, yeah, just for the sake of people having a go, from Monday, elaborate a little bit more on the tree policy, and I believe there's a little bit of a situation here with the current tree, is that right? Hence why there's some road widening not going on? Uh, not quite. There's some, there's some significant trees um, adjacent to the site in the road reserves. So some of the design requirements around the site have taken into consideration retention of those trees. Um, yeah, so there's there is some, some of the, the road frontage requirements give some consideration to those trees. Correct me if I'm wrong, that was a decision made when this was approved previously, however, to retain those trees. Yes, this that's right. This is not part of this. That's right, it's not part of this application. The Nothing's changing there. So to clarify that, to clarify those trees were a previous application and that is in a way inhibiting the widening of the road at all? Or? No, they're just, they restrict us in terms of um, where the footpaths go and whether we could provide off-street car parking in the road reserve if we wish to keep those trees. Okay, any further questions? Anyone need to speak to this? Put the motion, all those in favour? Aye. Thank you, the motion's carried unanimously. Uh, we move on to item five, which is development assessment fees and charges variations for April through to the end of December. Uh, item six is the Noosa District Sports Complex Master Plan Final. Uh, item number seven is the final version of the Karoi Sports Complex Master Plan. Item number eight is the Financial Performance Report for December. Item number nine is Local Government Legislative Reforms, Electoral and Other Legislation, Accountability, Integrity and Other Matters Bill. A report on that. Uh, item number ten is the update on Sustainable Tourism Stakeholder Reference Group. The recommendation is the general committee recommendations uh, of tonight be adopted, except we're dealt with or held over by other resolutions. I'll move that. Moved Councillor Jackson, seconded Second Councillor Wilkie. I'll put the motion. All those in favour? <coughs> Aye. Thank you. That's carried unanimously. Uh, that concludes the recommendations to this evening's uh, meeting. However, we have a report direct to the meeting, uh, which is a report on the draft South East Queensland Koala Conservation Strategy. Uh, Peter Milne, thanks for joining us. Any questions, councillors? Um, yes, I, I have Jackson. a couple of questions that I'd be interested to hear sure. more about. Um, Peter, thank you for um, your report and um, recommendations. 
Um, I'm interested to know a little bit more about the recommendation that the submission is suggesting we reinstating CAT XPMAV areas. Um, and the reason given is that this would have the opportunity for council to do offsets for koala uh, habitats. And I wonder if you could explain how those offsets actually work. So you could explain that a bit. Sure. So under the Vegetation Management Act, there's certain areas that are category X and uh, they're mostly developed areas. They've been developed in the past. Uh, some areas may have been developed up to 30, 40 years ago. So in that time, we've had regrowth vegetation. So regardless of the mapping of the legislation, that area still uh, can uh, provide koala habitat, uh, even though it's category X under the VMA. <coughs> under the VMA, there's not necessarily any vegetation protection measures unless there's another policy or legislation in place that covers that. Okay, so typically NUSA plan, um, the koala policy, uh, state koala policy as well, can also cover that. So if you can imagine there's multiple layers of policy that can cover those areas. So by removing category X, unfortunately we, we lose some of the protection mechanisms, particularly um, avoid mitigate offset provisions in some areas because they're not they don't go through that um, assessment process under the state policy. So avoid mitigate offset. You may not be able to stop development, but you may have you may be able to mitigate some of those impacts. You might be able to put in corridors, you might be able to retain certain habitat trees. Um, so avoid mitigate means reduce the impact as much as possible. Mm -hmm. But um, to offset is your offsetting the residual impacts. Mm -hmm. So impacts that you couldn't possibly avoid, we then offset and then apply those offsets in other ways. So could you explain the word offset and how sure. that actually, what it actually is? Okay, so the offset uh, policy provisions are set under the Offset Policy Act, um, which was brought into effect in 2014. And Offsets can be a number of things. They can be um, planting trees on another site, so creating koala habitat elsewhere. They can be a financial contribution. It might be for a particular study or research or something that'll help with koala conservation. Um, there's a range of different offset provisions. The, the most common one is actually planting trees, trying to reinstate koala habitat elsewhere. Okay, so can I just understand if the financial contributions you just mentioned, they would be used for other koala-related habitat matters. Um, is the funding actually quarantined in some way so that it is in fact used for that? Yes, that's correct. So um, it can be, it depends who the assessment manager is, so it can be quarantined at a state, state government level. They mm -hmm. have an account for offsets. Um, we could mm -hmm. also, we also um, exercise offset funds as well. So for example, we did have an offset down at um, uh, Settlers Cove area, which we delivered at Gurawin Nature Refuge. Oh, so right. funds from there mm -hmm. were used from that development to actually re reinstate mm -hmm. koala habitat. Yeah. And sorry, just another question. You mentioned at the beginning, as you were explaining, that mostly these particular types of properties are, you said, already developed. Yeah. So, the, But then you talked about development assessment and so it sounds like they're not really all developed. And, this, is that, and, and perhaps I'm wondering what implication it has for ones that in fact are developed. Yeah. So they have been developed at some point. So they might, have, they might have even 20, 30 years of regrowth. Obviously trees can keep growing. Yeah, but they have yeah. houses on them or something. Can be. Category developed. X areas so have developed. houses, yeah. development. Yeah, yeah. But some areas don't. They haven't been developed okay. at this point in time. So nevertheless, it, like, it can still create koala habitat. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so what's it. the implication for an owner of such a property? That's what I'm trying to understand. Yeah. Yeah. The implication for the landholder? Yeah. Um, okay. Well, it, it um, being removed uh, from that category X uh, from the koala mapping, there's, there's probably is very little implication for the landholder in that case. There's probably more of an implication for the landholder if if that category X wasn't removed. You know what I mean? And that will meaning what would be so what would be the implication then for that? Offset provisions might apply. 
if it's yeah. not removed, yeah. they but there it doesn't go retrospective. They've already owned it. So, I mean, I don't understand this no, because you back you're saying them. they're developed, and then you're saying that they would have to pay. But I don't quite understand that because they seem to be developed already. So I don't. Not all properties are developed no. in the category okay. X. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Some have got regrowth vegetation. So the ones you're referring to are the ones that are not developed. Yep. Okay. Thanks. Yep, yep. Mm -hmm. Any other questions, folks? I just had a question. Yeah, yeah. Councillor Wilkie. Follow up to could you explain what the acronym XPMAV and CADEX PMAV mean? What, yeah. what are they? What's the literal translation? What does that mean, please? Yeah. That the, the PMAVs are property maps of accessible vegetation. So, this is an agreement between the landholder and the state as to how that land is developed. It's not something that council's privy to. Okay, and um, the uh, Ural Wintail Forest was mentioned, project was mentioned. What is the significance of that project in terms of what the state is trying to achieve with this plan? The, How would I, I believe the Queensland Government actually sees the Ural Ring, Ringtail project as a flagship project for the state because it has so many multiple stakeholders involved. Every, you know, local government, state government, local environment groups, um, you know, the commercial operators like HQP plantations. Um, so they, they really see that as a really good model that they'd like to pursue uh, in other areas. So it is really like a pilot project, I guess, for the state. That's why it's so significant, and that's why it's mentioned in the in the draft strategy. I see they've given it a new moniker too. It's now it's now the Noosa Koala Corridor Pilot. Okay, it's got another name. Yeah, Councillor Wilkie, it could take off. Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, Peter, you you mentioned um, perhaps as one of the things you'd like to make a submission on that a noose of fifty percent of koala records. I assume that means sightings, koala yeah. records, are found in regrowth vegetation. Yet young regrowth is exempt from these proposed vegetarian vegetarian. Vegetation is <laughs> vegan clearing provisions. <laughs> um, is there, are you um, deliberately, uh, is it going to be exempt from all regrowth or just young regrowth? Various stages of regrowth. Young regrowth is not protected. Um, the regrowth in the planning scheme, for example, so over seven years, it does, it is protected. Yeah. And as it gets past that seven years, it's actually, it, it's the koalas love regrowth. They, they um, obviously, 50% of our records are, are found in the regrowth areas. But we often we don't have sufficient protection for those regrowth areas. There's a whole lot of exemptions that people can apply for uh, within regrowth areas. And so it does, given that nooses are fairly unique in that we do have 50% of our records in regrowth, we need to look closely at how we can better protect those regrowth areas because in some places it's just not, not protected. And what is the state thinking in moving to remove young regrowth or make young regrowth exempt? Uh, well, that'll be under the BMA. So that's under the, the current, they've got high value regrowth as a protection measure uh, mechanism. So typically, you know, very tall regrowth that's been there, you know, at least seven years. Um, that's as far as what they recognise in the BMA. So we, we probably need to look a bit closer to see how we can further that protection, perhaps through the planning scheme, through the biodiversity overlay. Um, again, just to get more, more protection around that regrowth. Because just because it's regrowth now that's only this high, may not necessarily become koala habitat now, but it could be in 10 years' time. So do we exclude those areas um, from our koala habitat areas, even though it's not the right vegetation at this point in time, I guess that's the question. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. One, one, would have to, to, one would have to assume that um, an assessment would be made on the type of um, regrowth, the type, the type of trees and that that are regrowth, and to see if they are actually Kohala habitat type of regrowth, or you're suggesting that uh, it could be replanted as part of an offset program and that uh, it, it then could be developed into Kohala habitat. Yeah, it could uh, certainly an area that right now may not be mapped as koala habitat. If we could uh, replant those areas, we can then turn that mapping over into into a mapped koala habitat area. That raises the protection level of, the, of that site. Yeah. Councillor Jackson, thank you, um, Peter. There's also another um, 
the item in the recommended um, submission, and that is about uh, fire management. It says there are a number of exemptions for clearing vegetation, particularly concerning fire management. Um, greater policy guidance is based on expert advice is required to ensure what clearing is relevant and practical to not only help protect life and property but minimize impacts on koala populations. Um, given that we've just been experiencing extreme fire events, um, I'm wondering what sort of, ad what kind of um, advice, guidance are you actually seeking here? Mostly in terms of setbacks, in terms of bush in relation to, to assets, asset protection and life protection. And a lot of, a lot of the, um, the impacts from fire from ember attack. And so by clearing a fire trail may not necessarily help protect an asset. So I guess the reaction is that there can be over clearing. You do need a, um, a separation. You need a separation for access for emergency services. Um, but if there's an over clearing, you're not really achieving um, a result, a good result, either for fire, fire protection or for, or for koalas. And obviously there's that conflict between um, life and property protection and also protecting koala habitat. So is there a potential for a conflict between protecting koalas and Most property? Definitely. And that's what you're seeking, guidance where yeah. this conflict isn't a conflict. Is, is that what you're seeking? Yeah, that's, that's definitely right. That's, that there is a conflict there that um, we can, I guess, landholders can actually overclear. That might be an immediate reaction, but we need to look closely at what, what the, um, the policy guideline is behind that. We need to develop good policy guidelines so we don't overclear. It may not, in some areas, it may not necessarily be the results that, that people are after. But it's kind of, it's it's sort of a um, an automatic response mm -hmm. um, to the to the fire issue. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Just with regard to just with regard to the, the development assessment. Now, uh, uh, it's clear from what uh, the state's trying to achieve here is that uh, significant development assessments with regard to koala habitat will now fall to the state to approve with regard to clearing of koala habitat. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. So, so previously local government had some uh, jurisdiction or authority to assess clearing in koala habitat areas that has now been shifted back to the state. Okay, so it's anything to do with uh, impacts on koala habitat uh, will be assessed by the state. So, yeah, sorry, 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 sorry. so are there any areas uh, earmarked for development within the Noosa Shire that may be impacted by the proposal here? Significant areas in particular. Um, not that I'm aware of. Not not at this point in time. Any any major um, and Kerry Mockdella answered this better than me. But if development assessments uh, applications were lodged um, previous to now, mm -hmm. um, they're still assessed under the old provisions. So there's no change. This is just a draft document going forward. It's proposal in the future. Um, in some ways, in some areas, there'll probably be stronger controls, but in other areas, there may be less controls. Okay. Yeah. Do you want to add to that in any way, Karen? Uh, yes, uh, just while we can't disclose the mapping and some of the locations, because uh, we've been asked to keep this confidential by the state, um, there are, we have seen that there are significant areas in Noosa where currently there would be an offset for koala. Um, habitat loss through development proposals and the new mapping will mean there'll be no offset applies and yet we know that it is definitely koala habitat and koalas are known to frequent the area so mm. some of the changes proposed are, are quite concerning mm. for that reason because they are quite significant areas and this is the same issue that redland shire it is it mm. is Had but um a, yeah we're plan. bound by confidentiality agreements and yes. so we aren't able to disclose that um, but it is, I find it very concerning because their whole goal is about no net loss of koala habitat and yet they've weakened it in one area where there'll be no, because because there's no offsets yep. able to be taken. And can uh, I just clarify, is that related to the P 
PMAV stuff, the CAT X, that's still the same things that we yeah. looked at mm -hmm. before. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Mm -hmm. Councillor Wilker, you had a question? No, that, that was along the lines of what I wanted yeah, that was to it. understand. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah, thank you. Any further questions? Looking for a mover and a seconder? No, I'll move. It. Move Councillor Wilkie, seconded oh. Councillor Jurisovic. Wish to speak to it, Councillor Wilkie? No, just to thank um, Peter for the work he has been doing uh, in this field for many, many years and also the tasks that you have ahead of you. Thank you for the report. Um, I realise you're bound by confidentiality. You can't ex exactly say which areas will, the protections will no longer apply. Um, we're ho I'm hoping that your submissions will uh, address that. Um, just a question, will the submission before it goes to the state come back to us or if we need to ratify it? Uh, I think that you'll find that the recommendation gives allowance for any minor changes and uh, to uh, what's proposed. So no, my understanding is that there's a, a very tight deadline here, mm -hmm. and so the submission will not be coming back to us because there simply isn't time to meet the deadline. Oh, no. well, I That's guess why the report's been rushed to us now. Yes, I, I guess I can only express the hope that um, this strategy does result in uh, its stated aims of providing greater protection for this uh, for koalas and um, help strengthen um, the local government's existing protections and complements it and not weaken it. Anyone else wish to speak to it? Yeah, I'll have a quick answer. Councillor Jurisvic. I said uh, one of the most concerning parts of the report for, uh, for mine is on page uh, 23. Within the KPA, 150,700 hectares has been identified as being suitable for restoration compared to the amount of uh, lost habitat since uh, the 1960s, there's a, a significant amount. But uh, in this report, they're only identifying 1,000 hectares for, uh, for rehabilitation. So there's a long, long way to go when the koalas are, are fighting an uphill battle. The recent uh, bushfires uh, in southern states are an example of, uh, of the challenges that uh, the koalas face. We know the challenges the koalas face within our fires. So I hope, I'm hoping that uh, <laughs> we'll see far more than 1,000 hectares de dedicated and, and offsets and plantings along those lines dedicated towards koala conservation in the future. Thank you. Any other councillors wish to speak? Feel the need to close, Councillor Wilkie? No, thank you, Mr Chair. I'll put the motion. All those in favour? Aye. Thank you. That's carried unanimously. Uh, that concludes the reports. There's no confidential session. However, we move on to public question time. Uh, Mr O'Connor, would you care to come forward and ask your questions, please? We'll do the one at a time, if you don't mind. Thank you. By withdrawing Lucy Council from the South East Queensland Council of Mayors that is negotiating with the state and federal governments a 2020 city deal funding agreement centred around a bid for the 2032 Olympic Games, has not our Shire lost out on a share of the reported $58 billion in infrastructure investment, economic and other benefits that will flow from the signing of the city deal involving all other local government areas in South East Queensland except Noosa? Uh, thank you. Uh, Brian, I'll uh, answer that one. Uh, your next question will be answered by Michael Shove. Um, my response is as follows. Uh, Noosa Council has not been a member of the SEQ Council of Mayors since 2015, in fact. Uh, Noosa Council was not getting sufficient value for money from its membership. Uh, the policy agenda for the SEQ Council of Mayors focuses on city and population growth biased issues, or based issues, I should say and does not align strategically with the Noosa Council's future priorities and our future needs. Not all South East Queensland councils, in fact, are a member of the SEQ Council of Mayors. Uh, Gold Coast City Council, for example, one of the biggest councils, has chosen not to be a member of the SEQ Council of Mayors. Um, there's very little that Noosa Council is likely to gain from city deals, in fact, um, because City Deals is primarily focused on high population growth areas requiring significant public infrastructure to support the growth. It's highly doubtful that Noosa would benefit from City Deals in terms of direct funding for public infrastructure, even if City Deals does come to fruition and, you know, it's been on the table for many years and it hasn't really progressed. Um, just to explain, as Mayor, I speak with other Mayors of the SEQ region whenever I need to. I can pick up the phone at any time. And of course, I deal with them at various functions and forums uh, where we all sit on the SEQ Regional Planning Committee. So I see them at those meetings, um, LGAQ events, etc. 
The CEO is also in regular touch with SEQ councils through their respective CEOs, most particularly, of course, as he is Queensland President of the Local Government Managers Association, but also informally through his CEO network. So in the end, the tens of thousands of dollars, and we are talking tens of thousands of dollars required to annually participate in the SEQ Council of Mayors is not really considered to be money well spent. We believe we can put it to better use on behalf of residents without any significant loss of engagement opportunities with other councils in South East Queensland. Thank you. So your next question, please. Next question. By Noosa foregoing inter-regional cooperation on transport connectivity and other common interests via the South East Queensland Council of Mayors alignment, instead, as the Mayor says, to forge closer ties with the Gympie Regional Council, what tangible outcomes have been achieved through that alliance? Thanks, I'll answer that one. Um, look, the close relationship between Noosa and Gympie Councils, it continues to deliver awards for both, both of us. Some examples of some tangible outcomes as you requested that I can mention tonight are, firstly, Gympie Council has been very supportive to Noosa during the recent local disaster events. For example, during the recent fires, Gympie offered immediate support and access, if needed, to their heavy plant and equipment, such as graders and dozers. They also offer their evacuation centres as backup should they have been needed, so that's one. Secondly, there have been many examples of information and resource sharing. Uh, Council recently hosted the Gympie Bridge Crew, who came down to compare... They don't play cards, they build bridges. <laughs> to, compare our work, ...to compare work practices. Um, this afforded us the opportunity to demonstrate how Noosa, our Noosa Council's success in the use of battery-powered equipment um, and plant related to bridge maintenance. Uh, thirdly, Gympie and Noosa have provided each other with expert staff to assist with specific employee recruitment. This can mean that Noosa staff can sit on uh, Gympie interview panels and vice versa, which has occurred. We share information at the operational level regarding governance matters. For example, we have shared internal audit plans, which has allowed the opportunity for each council to review the other council's forward plans and practices for continuous improvement. Both council CEOs periodically attend the respective audit and risk committee meetings of each council. This active participation allows the respective CEO to contribute positively at the meeting and also to consider improvements to their own governance and risk practices. We've established an agreed sharing of procurement information, allowing comparisons of costs and arrangements related to many essential items that both councils need to purchase. In addition to exploring shared arrangements, which combines our buying power in the market. We are also progressing discussions between the two councils currently to identify opportunities to maximise the use of plant and fleet through shared arrangements. So whilst this list isn't exhaustive, um, I believe that it does demonstrate the current good working relationship between the two councils. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Uh, so that concludes tonight's meeting. The next meeting is on the 20th of February here in Council Chambers at 6 p.m. I declare the meeting closed. Thank you for your attendance, everyone. Safe travels, Councillor Stockwell. Hey, good evening, everyone. See you, Rob.